Uh, the fruit of good ministry is transformation of life. I'm getting nervous. I might fall off this chair. It's a little wobbly this morning. But I'll just stand up and I'll fall away. Here, but, um, it's not numbers. It's nice to look around and see a lot of people here in our, in our kids. Uh, we got a lot of kids here. There's sometimes 40 kids in the back as we gather here to worship. And, uh, but it's not about numbers. It's about transformation of life. It's about people coming to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and coming to that relationship in a way that makes a real difference in their attitude, their actions, and how they live their life. Um, turning folks from consumers of religious goods and consumers of all kinds of things, which we're going to talk about this morning, into servants, into those who have uh, hearts that are leaning toward receiving and consuming, to people who come to know God's grace in Jesus Christ and want to become agents that reflect God's generosity in the world. Amen? And, uh, and so the real fruit of, of New Testament ministry is the transformation of life. And I'm so proud of the folks uh, who joined this morning. And we're just so delighted to have you here with us um, as members of our church family. Uh, for those of you that were here last week, we started a new Thanksgiving series called Enough. And uh, we are trying to find ways to experience joy through simplicity and generosity. And the message last week sought to answer one very important question. What is happiness, and how can I get some? Um, and, uh, and what we did was, we, we looked at all kinds of worldly definitions of happiness, and when we did this, uh, after we went through different uh, worldly definitions of happiness, we considered the following possibility. What if the root of all of our worldly understandings of happiness is really the desire to replace bad feelings caused by not having enough of something with good feelings associated with some kind of pleasure. We began to contemplate if that is at the root of the way we typically define happiness. And then uh, we turned to God's Word and we sought a biblical understanding of happiness and we looked at five virtues that we have to embody if we are going to experience the happiness that God has for us. And if you missed that message, you can access that on YouTube by going to our church website. The address should be printed on the bulletin that you received this morning. And there is a sermons link off to the left-hand side, and you can go and retrieve that and watch it. But uh, this morning, I want to build on that message by exploring two major pitfalls that, um, that we face whenever we live out of the fear of not having enough. Really two major pitfalls uh, that we're in danger of stumbling into if we're living out of a fear of not having enough. And these two pitfalls can be described as gorging and hoarding. Gorging and hoarding. And, um, and, and there's much at stake in what we're going to be exploring this morning because both of these things can choke our faith to death can pierce us with much grief and can ultimately lead to our spiritual death. And so there's much at stake here. And while these two, uh, gorging and hoarding, seem to be polar opposites, what we're going to discover this morning is that when we look a little closer, they both have a common cause. They are both um, rooted in the love of money or are trying to trust possession and wealth to secure us in this world. So I want to start with the Bible this morning, and I want to look at two foundational texts that will help um, set the stage for everything else that we do this morning. And the first comes from 1 Timothy 6.10. And uh, this is what that text says. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, the, the, that second part of the verse is very, very important. As folks fall in love with money, it causes them to drift away from their faith, drift away from God, 
And in the process of trying to secure themselves, they end up piercing themselves. You see that? Themselves there? It's something that, that someone doesn't do, do to us. It's in our pursuit of wealth and our love of money that we actually inflict grief upon ourselves. So keep that on uh, one side of your brain. Now, the other passage is actually uh, what has been called the parable of the sower or the parable of the four souls. If you have your Bibles this morning, I actually want you to turn to this. This is the longer passage that we're going to be delving into. Uh, or if you have a tablet or a phone, you can uh, bring this up. And if you don't have a tablet, a phone, or a Bible, then uh, you can read it off the worship screen. This is from the New International Version. And, and, uh, and I want to skip to verse 3. Uh, the first couple of verses just set it up by saying that this is Jesus who is talking to us. But if you jump down, it says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, in this passage, it's one of the few parables where Jesus actually interprets it for you. Okay, so there's no question about what this means, because Jesus tells us exactly what it means. And he says this, listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, and he's referring to the preaching of the gospel. In this passage, he's referring to his own preaching of the gospel, but now we can interpret it as any time the gospel is preached. Okay? When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. I call these bottle rocket Christians. Shoot! Yeah. Okay? The seed falling among the thorns, and this is what I really want you to pay careful attention to refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. And I just, I just want to say that both of these passages of Scripture are warning us or cautioning us against putting our trust in material possessions, putting our trust in wealth, or the experiences that that wealth can afford to us. And there's all kinds of things that our wealth can afford. And, um, and it's saying you cannot put your ultimate trust in wealth or possessions or people or things. Your ultimate security has to be grounded in God. And Jesus says that if we worry about our life and then we turn to wealth to try to alleviate that worry, that it will pull us away from God. It will cause us innumerable griefs. And I like the way that the Bible puts it. They pierce themselves. You ever felt pierced by grief? Right? And eventually will spiritually kill you. And, and it will also emotionally kill you. It will also kill your relationships. And for people uh, in which this is manifested through, uh, through workaholism, it will kill you physically. It will give you a heart attack or stroke. And so Jesus is saying uh, we have to be really, really careful about the relationship that we have with possessions and wealth. And uh, what I would like to do this morning is I want to look at what that choking of faith actually looks like in real life. Okay? Jesus says... If you worry about life and then you try to use money uh, to get out of that worry, it'll choke you to death spiritually. And I want to look exactly at what that choking um, 
how, how it plays out or manifests itself in real life. And, the, and, and, it, and it actually does it in two different ways, and I've already mentioned it. Gorging and porting. So I want to start with gorging because that's, that's the obvious one that we see all the time. And gorging is the hedonistic consumption driven by the fear of not being satiated. Um, it's driven by the fear of not being filled, not being complete, not being whole. Am I speaking your language, church? Missing something, having a hole in your life and trying to fill it up with people, things, and experiences. So when we're talking about food, gorging refers to one of the seven deadly sins, and that's gluttony. Right? That's when even after your body is satiated, you keep cramming stuff into your pie hole. Right? <laughs> Stuffing yourself. Right? When we're talking about sex, gorging yourself refers to another, set, another one of the seven deadly sins, and that's called lust. It's when you are consuming uh, visions or images or sights or experiences, and it's never enough. Um, lust. When we're talking about money, gorging means spending money we don't have on things we don't need or spending money we don't have on experiences <coughs> that we don't need. And if it is related to keeping up with the Joneses, it is also connected with one of the seven deadly sins that we call envy. Has anybody, has anybody have children and read the Bernstein Bears, the green-eyed monster to their kids? If you have, raise your hand. It's a really good little book. Only one or two people. Wow. It's a really good story. Um, and, and I want to say that, uh, that the common cause of all these different manifestations of gorging, okay, all of them have a common cause. And that is trying to consume away our bad feelings. And no matter how much we spend, no matter how much we devour, no matter how much we use, no matter how much we throw into that hole in our heart that only God can fill, it's never enough. And it's, a, it's the temptation of trying to use people and things and experiences to get us out of our fear, out of our anxiety, out of our depression, out of our feeling of instability and chaos out of our feeling of emptiness, right? So there's an emptiness, and we're trying to use people, things, and experiences to fill that void inside of us, trying to use things of the world to fill that God-sized hole to make us feel okay, to be able to tolerate life, to be able to take the next step. And, um, and, it, and its manifestation comes out of a fear of not being satiated. Again, not feeling whole, not feeling complete, not being at peace. And it leads to an anxious existence, right? Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to use things of the world to fill an existential void inside of us. Does anybody know what I mean when I say that? took philosophy, these are the existentialists, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, those folks, right? We have this existential angst, this experience of, uh, of humanity, of what it means to be human, that comes out of a place of anxiousness and fear. It's, ex it's an existential emptiness inside of us that we're trying to fill up. And, um, and as we try to escape bad feelings, we do this by giving to ourselves. Have you ever heard someone say, now, now I'm not condemning anybody because I say this too, but have you ever heard someone say, I'm going to spoil myself this week? Right? And why, why do we typically say that? We have a bad week. We're not feeling very well. And, uh, and maybe if we're on a diet or something, we say, I'm going to spoil myself and we get, we get a big cookie or a piece of pie. Right? Um, some people say, you know, I'm going to take a bubble bath. I know none of the guys here would say that, but I'm going to spoil myself, right? But, but it's a, uh, whenever we're living out of the fear of, of not being satiated, our giving is always a giving to ourselves to try to fill that void. 
And even when it appears that we're giving a gift to another person, that's still only for ourselves, right? Because we're looking for a benefit. So we give something to another person, we expect some kind of return. Either a relational return, uh, an acknowledgement of gratitude and thank you so much, and, and the good feeling that you get when someone receives it well, or perhaps it's leverage in the relationship, right? You've heard the phrase debt of gratitude. Someone gives you something, it creates a debt of gratitude. That gives the giver leverage in the relationship. Or perhaps when you give to someone else out of this anxious fear, it's because you're trying to get in good standing with someone who has power over you and can make your life easier, like your boss. Give your boss a Christmas gift. You might think that he's the most wretched person in the world, but you're going to give him a Christmas present because he's your boss. And uh, from the perspective of gorging, all of our giving is tainted by a desire to consume away our emptiness. I want you to say that with me, okay? Our spending and giving is always tainted by a desire to consume away our emptiness. Say, consume away our emptiness. <laughs> That's the most important part. Consume away our emptiness. And it is a life that lacks simplicity and aims at extravagance. And a great example of this is Charlie Sheen. Perfect example. Uh, Charlie Sheen is a great example of someone who was empty inside and trying to find happiness through hedonistic indulgence. And, uh, and he happens to be a hero of many of the frat boys that I teach at Florida Southern. And uh, despite his unlimited wealth, despite his hyper-indulgent consumption, consumption of, um, of alcohol and drugs and sex, Despite all of this, and, and also the uh, being admitted into the lifestyles of the rich and famous and all the privilege and power that brings, despite all of that, a rational person would be hard-pressed to look at Charlie Sheen and say, he's really happy. He's really happy. His overindulgence has actually cost him dearly. He's been arrested on more than one occasion. It has destroyed his relationships, as is evident in divorces. Um, and at times, it appears to have driven him crazy, which also has been captured on film and, and made him the laughing stock of the world. And it has seriously endangered his health. And, uh, and it doesn't matter how much he consumes. And again, he has unlimited resources to consume just about anything that he wants. And it seems like no matter how much he consumes, it's never enough. He doesn't have peace. He doesn't have a sense of stability. And other examples of this are uh, Hugh Hefner, the Kardashians, and, and, uh, and Tucker Max, who wrote a couple of books that I can't even share the titles with you because of the wording they used to describe the titles. Okay. And, and at the end of the day, it seems like American culture pretends to condemn this at the very same time they celebrate it. And so there are internal pulls toward gorging, which is that desire to consume away our emptiness. And there are external pour, uh, pulls to gorging, namely a culture that idolizes celebrities that gorge themselves and act as if that is the real American dream. And so we, we find ourselves being pulled in lot, lots of different directions, wanting to consume away our sadness, our anxiety, our emptiness. But the problem with all of this is that we cannot spend or consume away our emptiness. Do you believe that this morning? How many people have tried it? I'm raising my hand because I have. Right? You cannot consume or spend away your emptiness, your sadness, your anxiety, your sense of meaninglessness in the world. You cannot consume these things away. Only God can heal your broken heart. So that you feel some sense of peace. So that you are truly satiated. That you are filled. That you are complete and whole. Only God can do that through Jesus Christ. And so the solution is not consuming. It is bowing before God and asking for forgiveness and healing and peace. Uh, the second problem, uh, I'm sorry, the, the second part of the solution, the first solution is turning to God and 
and relinquishing the false hope that we can somehow consume away our unhappiness. Right? Um, but, but we also have to recognize that in the very act of doing this, it makes it very harder for us to see the real, the real solution to the problem. Have you experienced that? It's like the more that we reach out to people, things, and experiences to get out of the discomfort and the pain caused by our brokenheartedness, the more difficult it is to see the one and receive the one that can actually heal us. And so again, it's, it's, it's pulling us away from God. And, and instead of things in the world being transparent and pointing to God's grace and God's healing and being signs for us to turn to God, those things of the world become opaque. They become idols. They become things that we turn to in and of themselves. And eventually, I'm going to tell you, if you haven't experienced this, the more that we do this, the more likely it is that this consuming is going to take on an addictive quality. It's going to take on the dynamics of addiction. And it's going to lead to slavery. And it's going to continue to pull you away from God. This gorging financially, if we're talking about money, will eventually put you in slavery to debt, to creditors, and to worry, the, co the constant worry and stress of not having enough. And, and the reason why gorging is so insidious the reason why it's so evil is because it is motivated, now catch this, this is very counterintuitive. It's motivated by the fear of not having enough of something, but as we gorge, it makes that fear grow worse. If you've experienced that, raise your hand this morning. It's motivated by fear of not having enough of something. There's this hole in there. We start throwing things in it. And the more that we throw in that hole, it just, it just goes down like a black hole. There's no bottom to it. And just as it's going right through us, the hole opens up even worse. And so the very problem that we're trying to get, to get rid of, the bad feelings, uh, become intensified. And so what is the solution? Again, turning to God, giving up the false hope that you can consume away your, your unhappiness, your emptiness, your anxiety, your depression, your loneliness, your boredom, your meaninglessness. You can't consume that away. Because there's not enough food, sex, and drugs, and money in the world to make you feel better. If you don't believe me, there's a book written by the former rhythm guitar player of Korn, the rock band Korn. He wrote a book called Save Me From Myself. And that guy had the same kind of uh, access to wealth and drugs and sex and everything else that Charlie Sheen did. Except, whereas Charlie Sheen kind of wears it as a badge of honor, uh, Head fell, his name is Head, that was his nickname, Head. He fell on his knees and gave his life to Jesus Christ. And at the end of his book, after he's explained all of the things that he's been through, all of the hyper-indulgent consumption that he engaged in, he's got this haunting line at the very back of the book that says, Brothers and sisters, I have tried it all, and I'm telling you, there is only one thing that will satisfy your soul, and that is Jesus Christ, period, that's it. Amen. And he's, he did it all. He did it all, right? So the first step is turning to God. The second uh, part of the solution is practicing the spiritual discipline of simplicity. There's a great phrase, if you haven't heard it, I want you to remember when you leave today, and it's this. Live simply so that others may simply live. Live simply so that others may simply live. Simplicity is a way of life that clearly distinguishes wants from needs and then makes the conscious decision to focus on needs so that they will have money left over to give to those who are in need. And this way of life is diametrically opposed to gorging. And if we practice, if we practice simplicity, it will help cultivate inside of us the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. Or self discipline. So I want to put a couple of passages up. Uh, the first one comes from Galatians 5.22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. Self By the way, this is what you have to have to be happy to say. Okay? But self-control is definitely one of them. The next passage comes from Proverbs 25.28. It says, Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Again, there's no boundary there. It just goes right through you. It leaves you feeling even more empty inside. And then uh, finally, if we're, talking, uh, if we're talking about finances, 
This self-control, this discipline, this living simply so that others can simply live, will manifest itself in the form of responsible dealings with your own finances. It will result in budgeting, paying off your debts, saving money for a rainy day. And I just want to remind you that the devil does not need anything really dramatic to destroy your relationship with God. He doesn't need an affair. He doesn't need uh, an addiction. He doesn't need some, uh, uh, some major event like being arrested by the cops for breaking the law. He doesn't need, the devil doesn't need anything that dramatic to ruin your life and destroy your relationship with God. Because if the devil can just keep you spending, it will destroy your ability to live the life to which God has called you. We've already talked about this a little bit. God calls you to give to the poor. If you keep spending, you won't have anything to give to the poor. You can't be obedient in that regard. God says to you, I want you to go on a mission trip, and I want you to minister to poor people in other countries. Say, I can't afford the plane ticket. I can't be obedient in that regard. God says, I want you to tie so that you can support the building up, uh, the, the building up of the kingdom and the binding up of the broken heart of your community. Say, I don't have any money to give. I've spent too much. Right? And so if the devil can keep you spending, it will destroy the possibility of you being obedient to God, and it will continue to have you stressed out and worried all the time about not having enough, and it will spiritually kill you. You see how it works? It doesn't take an affair. It doesn't take an addiction. It takes this gradual, slow creeping of just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So that's the first one, is gorging. The second one is hoarding. And, uh, and hoarding is the fear of not having enough security. Uh, this is the fear of not saving or accumulating enough in our storehouse and the fear of being left out in the cold on a rainy day. Or it's also the fear of saving everything and then living in constant fear that you're going to lose what you've saved and invested. And, uh, and the common cause, like gorging, okay, is the love of money. It's trusting wealth for ultimate security. That's it, the, uh, that, that's at the base of it. Now I want to uh, just kind of, I know this is a long service day, so I've got a little video that I want to show um, that kind of will help you gather what I'm trying to say about the worry that comes with hoarding. loves what money can buy, while, while gorging loves the way that money can buy things to try to eliminate the bad feelings and replace them with good feelings, uh, hoarding loves the kind of security that money can give. And, um, and this is hard to diagnose. It's really hard to diagnose hoarding for a couple of reasons. Number one, we tend to focus almost exclusively on gorging because it's obvious and it's rampant, right? You look around, you see people overspending all the time. Um, one of the main points of Financial Peace University, which we're doing here at the church, is the importance of not being uh, a compulsive spender and, and squandering your money, but being, uh, being wise in the way that you deal with your finances. And so gorging is what we tend to focus on almost exclusively because it's obvious and it's rampant. But another reason why hoarding is so difficult to diagnose as sin is because it often disguises itself as prudence, fiscal responsibility and thriftiness. You see, hoarding is associated with behaviors that we find very acceptable and very honorable, like 
living on a budget, paying off our debts, everything that we mentioned, which is the solution for gorging. Um, we, we, we look at those things and we say those are good practices. That's what responsible people do. But I want to tell you, folks, that if taken to the extreme, this hoarding can lead to over-responsibility. It can lead to lack of compassion and a failure to give to people who are in need because you're scared to give because you, then you might not have enough. It leads to cold and calculated decisions made purely on numbers, like when an, employ, like when an employer lays off uh, workers in order to increase their profit margins at the end of the year, unnecessary layoffs. It can lead to stinginess and greed and tight-fistedness and a false sense of security. And, uh, and as a side note, I want, you to, I want you to see that these concepts of gorging and hoarding uh, can help us think biblically about what's going on in our country politically right now. There are some who are being accused of gorging, right? And they're being accused of being irresponsible when it comes to managing uh, the money of our country. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, and those folks criticize by saying we need to be fiscally responsible. And we do, but there is another danger, which is the opposite extreme, which is hoarding, which is not caring for the poor. And so, uh, and so these, these biblical categories can help us to understand that the answer doesn't usually lie on the, in one extreme or the other. It somehow uh, can be struck in a balance somewhere in the middle. But we have to be, be, be aware of both of these dangers. And, uh, and here's the problem. Only God can secure you. Money cannot secure your future. A fat bank account cannot secure your future. And the Bible says over and over and over again, you cannot trust in your wealth for your ultimate security. And so Jesus says... Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. Now I want to say this is not saying that we ought to be irresponsible and that we shouldn't save because we see in other passages like Proverbs, the wise store up food and oil and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. It's not that we shouldn't save so that when a rainy day comes, we become burdens to other people. We need to be responsible. But what, what Jesus is saying here, and not storing up treasures on earth, but storing up treasures in heaven, is not to put too much confidence in wealth. Not to fall in love with money. Not to put your ultimate security in money. And, um, and so the first problem is, money can't secure you. Only God can. The second problem is that we cannot experience real happiness without generosity. All the scientific studies that have been done said that the happiest people in the world are the people that are the most generous. Did you know that? People that have the ability, that's the first thing. You've got to have the ability to give. And you've got to be fiscally responsible to have anything to give. But the people that have the ability to give and then actually do it generously are the happiest people in the world. But we can see over and over and over again that greed kills. The, the, the compulsion to hoard and to hold on to what we have uh, with a greedy heart uh, can kill our spirits. Second problem is that we cannot be obedient to God unless we give, because God asks us over and over again to give to the needy, to give our tithe, to give uh, through mission trips and all kinds of things. And so if we can't give, we can't be obedient to God. And finally, <laughs> another problem with hoarding is that, again, like the dog in the video, we're constantly worried about losing it. How many of you check the stock market every day? Okay. One. Lights are a little on. I know, I know a couple people that check the stock market like every hour. They've got a phone app. They're looking how their investments are doing. And, um, and that uh, is, is a manifestation of constant worry about losing what we're investing. And of course, instead of Charlie Sheen, the paramount example of this is Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. That tight-fisted, cheap, person who was unwilling to help others and had no generosity in his heart. So we don't want to gorge, but nor do we want to be stingy and greedy and fail to give. So what's the solution to the hoard? Number one, it's very simple. You have to trust God in your security, not your money. The Bible says that, that the world can take everything that you have away from you. If the world's taken everything away from you, raise your hand. I know we have a few here. One, two, three, four. Five, six, we've had some people. 
The Bible says the world can take everything away from you. And you're still secure in God. Your security does not lie in your possessions or in your wealth. The second part of the solution is practicing the, spirit, uh, the spiritual discipline of generosity. Engorging, it's practicing the discipline of simplicity. And hoarding, it's practicing the discipline of generosity. And so every opportunity that you get, release what you have to share with others. Especially those who are, um, who are the most down and out and are incapable of giving you anything in return. And let it go for the glory of God. So I'm going to ask the, the praise band to come forward this morning and... Um, and, and as we continue to kind of, as we continue to reflect on these two extremes, I want you to ask yourself, where do I fall on this scale? Um, am I gorging? And gorging doesn't have to do again just with money. Gorging has to do with using people, places, experience, and things to consume away our bad feelings. Is that where you are this morning, or is that is that what you're struggling with this morning? If so, I'm going to pray for you. Or are you having difficulty hoarding? Are you saving so much that you're scared to let something go to bless someone else out of fear that you will end up broken down and busted? Amen. Where are you this morning? And I just want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to pray for people that are struggling on both of these extremes. And then we're going to sing our final song and be dismissed. Would you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you.